read a lot of the books, and it's been one of my hobbies and one of my interests for a very long time. So that's where I'm coming from. And at the end, I'm going to give you resources that you can go to to learn more about NLP without having to go to seminars. Um, I'll give you some reputable books uh, to go to. And also, I'll tell you some of the good seminar tapes to listen to. Um, so that's a little bit about me. So my goals for the talk. How many here have heard of NLP? Wow. Um, I'm basically doing this talk because there are a lot of people who have heard of NLP, but there are more people who have heard of NLP but have a really wacky view of exactly what it is. And that's a lot of that is because the only way to learn about NLP is by going to a seminar. And people just don't have the money to go to seminars. And when they advertise the seminars, they say all this crazy stuff, you know, the, the theory of excellence or, you know, hypnosis. And people just don't know what's going on. People think that NLP is all about mind control, which it really isn't. Although you can use it for mind control. All right. So my first goal is to give an introduction to NLP. And this is just an introduction. I'm going to try to squeeze, like, a week-long seminar into an hour, right? So I'm going to skip a lot of stuff. I'm going to go really fast through a lot of stuff. There's a lot of information on these slides. So I would suggest that you go back later, look at the CD, look at online, look at the slides, and it will all make sense to you more later on. So that's my first goal. And my second goal is to give you tools for using NLP to influence. I thought that um, looking at NLP from an influence standpoint would be a good thing to do at a hacker convention. Because a lot of you are into social engineering but a lot of you on a minute, right? <laughs> All right, so in order to give you tools, I'm going to give you several specific tools. One of them is gaining rapport, um, and I'll talk a lot more about that. Uh, motivation strategies. I might do uh, submodalities. I might skip through it um, because of time restraints to get, because I want to get to the good stuff, which is the Milton model. Trust me, that's the good stuff. That's the hypnosis stuff. You want to learn that. Um, so what is NLP? Let me, this mic is kind of... All right, so what is NLP? Um, one of the reasons why you're not going to hear one definition of NLP is because NLP isn't the study of anything. You can't put it in one sentence. So what I... What I basically say, and like if you read these, the books that I'm going to uh, show you in a little while, they'll say that NLP is the study of, uh, not the study, the uh, science of, influ of excuse me, the science of excellence. And that is really ambiguous. And I think it's ambiguous, you know, for a reason to get people interested in it. It, it kind of makes sense, but that's not really what NLP is. So what I say is that NLP is first and foremost a philosophy about how the mind works. And it's also a set of tools for using that philosophy to do a wide variety of things. Some of those things include hypnosis, uh, therapy, uh, change, uh, all sorts of different things. And so what I'm going to do in the introduction is give you an introduction to the philosophy of NLP. And the philosophy of NLP, and NLP stands for neuro-linguistic programming. And you can break that down, and that'll tell you the different parts of the philosophy. First, there is the neurology. And that includes our five senses. Five senses, you know, hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, five senses. Linguistic refers to language. And the way we use language to describe our world. Um, one of the major theories in philosophy, psychology, and linguistics is that the way that we interact with the world, the way, that, the way that we perceive the world is through language. If we don't have a word for it, it's very hard for us to perceive. And some would say it's, some would say it's impossible for us to perceive um, without a word for it. So that's one part. And then programming. Programming refers to the habitual... What do I put? The habitual and often sequential nature of our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Um, I'm going to go over the presuppositions of NLP, and I'll go over this a little more in detail. But basically, the idea is that you know the brain is a computer, and the way that the brain works as a computer is to do 
the thing that spins the, less, the least amount of energy. So what we do is we get into habits. We have certain processes, certain sequences we go through to do things, and we do the same thing every time. We might not realize or recognize what that sequence is, but we always go through it. NLP is one way of recognizing what that sequence is, finding out how we use it, and finding out how to change it, finding out how to make better sequences, and so on and so, so forth. So the history of NLP. NLP started in the 70s um, by two guys, Richard Bandler and John Grinder. Um, they basically, let's see, John, John Grinder was a, a linguistic, was studying linguistics, and Richard Bandler was studying uh, psychology. And they decided to go out and study successful therapists. Okay. There you go. So they studied successful therapists. They wanted, they wanted to find out if these therapists, like Virginia Satur or Fritz Perls at the time, um, these therapists were really successful at what they were doing. And they wanted to find out if there was a way of modeling what they were doing, trying to figure out linguistically exactly what they were saying, and if there was something common between all of them. And by finding that out, they were going to create a model of successful therapy and then be able to teach it to other people. So they went in believing that they were going to be able to do this. So they observed patterns in their behaviors. And out of this study came the book, The Structure of Magic. It's actually two books, The Structure of Magic 1 and 2. And that book describes what is known as the meta model. Now, the meta model is basically the result of all of this. Um, basically, you know, they observed the therapist and found out what questions they asked. And the meta model is a way of asking questions to get to the real nature of what someone is trying to say. A lot of times, people will be ambiguous about what they're saying, or they'll leave out things in what they're saying, um, or they'll say things. Um, like, uh, I am really fascinated by this person. Now, if I say I'm really fascinated by someone, it makes sense to me. My idea of what fascination is and the process that fascination is in my mind is unique to me. Other people might have different processes for fascination. So if I tell someone that I'm fascinated with someone else, um, then I'm not really telling them what's going on in my head. And the meta model is a way of getting to that, that core. And it creates a really successful uh, therapeutic context. Now, after creating the, after the structure of Magic 1 and 2, um, Richard Bandler and John Grinder um, were contacted by someone who introduced them to Milton H. Erickson. Now, Milton Erickson, at the time, um, was known as the most successful hypnotherapist in the world. He was doing stuff that no one could figure out. He could take people who said that they are, it was impossible for them to hypnotize, and he could you know, shake their hand and do the handshake induction and have them go under in you know, 10 minutes. And, and no one understood what was going on. I mean, even, even uh, Erickson said that he didn't quite know exactly what he was doing. He had just developed throughout the years this system that was working. And so, so somebody said, oh, well, OK, so these guys are really good at modeling therapists, what hap what was, what's going to happen if they model uh, Milton Erickson? And what came out of that is the Milton model. And I'm going to teach you a little bit of the Milton model. Basically, what the Milton model is, is a way of indirect hypnosis. It's a way of indirectly communicating with the subconscious mind by manipulating the, uh, sub the substructure of, of uh, Linguistics. So when I say, like, if, like when I say, um, basically it's the reverse of the meta model. Where the meta model is, you're trying to find something more specific. The Milton model seeks to leave things out and to be ambiguous, so that the mind has to fill fill that stuff in. And by doing that, people go in, go inside themselves, and they're able to find resources within themselves, and they're and they're able to more communicate with their subconscious. And by doing that, become more subject, uh, become more suggestible. You don't have to know that, but. That's basically what indirect hypnosis is. And I'll, I'll go over the Milton model a little bit later. So not only did it, it, they get the Milton model out of that, and this really brought NLP just light years ahead of what it was. This is what, the Milton model is what took NLP to what it is today. Um, it also proved 
that powerful skills can be duplicated. Because what they did was they took Milton Erickson's uh, way of hypnosis, they modeled it, they used it themselves, and then they were able to successfully teach it to other people. Also from uh, the Milton model and from Milton Erickson, they got what are known as the presuppositions of NLP. Presuppositions are um, basically assumptions, and I'll actually go over that later. The first one is the major um, tagline of NLP is the map is not the territory. Basically what that means is that, okay, you're, you know, imagine you're looking at uh, a road map. You know, you lay a road map, map out of, you know, uh, you know lay, lay a road map out of Las Vegas. Now, that road map is really useful. You can use it to find your way. You can use it if you get lost. You can even use it to, to describe um, the landscape, you know, in pretty specific terms. But that map is not Las Vegas. You know, there, there is an infinite amount of complexity in the actual thing, but the map only describes what is useful. The map is not the territory in NLP means that your mind does the same thing with reality. The idea is that reality is really bombarding you with an infinite amount of information, but you're filtering that information through, through a map that you create, basically, of, of your world through language and, and through the language describes your subjective experience. So every experience, experience has a structure. That's basically the same thing. I'm gonna go a little quick for these, there's a lot of them. Um, and if you go to the, you know, get the books, uh, go do some research online, you'll, you'll be able to uh, get these a little bit more in depth. But every experience of the structure is basically the same thing as what I was talking about with, um, with like fascination. You know, every thing that you experience has a sequence and it's usually, it, it's usually in sequential order and it's usually, you're able to, to figure it out, you're able to influence it. And so every experience has a structure. The mind and body are parts of the same system. Anything you do to the body will affect the mind. Anything you do to the mind will affect the body. The, the idea is that there's not this separate mind and body, but that they interact with each other. Um, if, if any person, one person can do something, anyone else can learn it. The idea is that we are all human beings. We all have basically the same hardware, so to think that one person can be really good at, you know, social engineering or can be really good at programming and you can't is pretty absurd because we all have the same, the same thing. We all, however, think differently, but that does not mean that we have different brains. So if we're able to think like another person, we're able to do the things that the other people are able to do. Um, people already have all the resources they need. Um, just the idea that you, it's basically like resources. When I talk about resources, they're talking about memories, emotions. Um, you know, you, you think about um, some people are really, like some people are really confident in one situation. Like some people are, you know, in the military and they're, they, they can go out and, you know, jump out of a plane and feel okay with it but when they're up in front of people, they get nervous and feel like they're gonna throw up, right? So why is that? It's because they're, they're using their resource for confidence in one place and not in the other place. The idea is that they have that resource to be confident, but it's somewhere else. And NLP um, can help someone to, to use resources more widely. And yeah, and that, that's one of the um, applications of uh, uh, NLP and therapy. Um, you could not not communicate. Basically, the idea is even if you're not speaking, as long as you're within eye shot of someone, or you know you are communicating with them, uh, there there is no way to not communicate with someone except not see them, not be anywhere near them. Um, there is a uh, there is one uh, one statistic, I don't really like statistics all that much, but there's one statistic that says that 70% of our communication is nonverbal. 
So, you know, think about that next time you try to have a, a deep, meaningful conversation online. You know, think about how much you're missing out on the real communication. A lot of, you know, that's, that's, where, uh, that's where LJ drama comes in. Anyone know? Okay. <laughs> My friends are going through LJ drama right now, so I keep reminding them about that. Um, the meaning of your communication is the response you get. You may have an intention when you communicate with someone, but if you say someone to someone and they get angry because you said it, you have, your communication has, has triggered something in them to make them angry. So it's not about what you intended to do, it's about the response that you're getting. So you have to, you have to change your communication to match the response that you want to get and the other person. Um, Underlying every behavior is a positive intention. Uh, this is one of the ideas also in the therapy of NLP, um, where a lot of people, when when they're like when they're depressed, right, and they're they're not they're not feeling good. It's it's not necessarily because their brains are working poorly. It's because their brains are working really well, but they're not using them in the correct way. Um, one of the one of the easy ways of describing this is just to say that a lot of people ask themselves questions, you know, and when you ask your subconscious a question, it will answer it, no matter what question you ask them. So a lot of people, when they're feeling bad, they ask themselves, you know, why do I feel so shitty? And their subconscious says, well, here you go. There is this list of things. This is here's why you feel shitty, you know. So NLP teaches people to ask better questions, to ask questions such as. How can I get out of this? How can I feel better? People don't think to ask these questions because they don't think that they have the resources to answer them. But the, the truth is that you have the resources to answer these questions. And talking about answering questions, um, if you guys have any questions, I have stuff to give away. So um, I'll just give these away for good questions. Um, and you know, there's no such thing as a bad question. So. Yes. To get over the fear of it? Um, getting rid of fear, and, and one of the big things of NLP is a phobia cure. It takes 20 minutes, one session. It all deals with the way that you look at things in your mind. People think that change is a long, painful process. Change can be very quick. It, it only takes the, the, the ability to believe that you're first able to change. If you, don't, if you don't believe that you're able to change, then change will take a really long time until you believe that you're able to change. One, Um, there, there are, uh, I don't know specifically, um, but it's not subliminal. Actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to go over the books later, but this book, NLP, uh, New Achievement of Technology is a very good book for that. It goes over a lot of the NLP techniques and, uh, will actually take you through them. They're, they're basically, um, thought exercises. They're not really subliminal. Oh, yes. Newbies practicing hypnotism. Um, when, I, when I get to, uh, well, I'll just tell you right now. Um, basically, hypnosis is not anything all that special. Um, basically, when you're driving down the road and you suddenly, you know, you're suddenly at your destination and you don't remember how you got there, that's hypnosis. It's, it's, not a, it's, it's not a state that makes someone do anything you tell them to. Basically, hypnosis makes people more open to suggestions, but people won't do things that, they, that could go completely against their core beliefs. So newbies practicing hypnosis, it, it, can, be, it can be dangerous, but not extremely dangerous because there's always a block in, in people's in people's minds and 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 people 
you know, don't usually hypnotize themselves because they don't want to be hypnotized. They usually hypnotize themselves because they, they, they want to be hypnotized. And, uh, you know, pe people hypnotize themselves all the time and not realize it, basically. So it's not something that's, you know, you're not going to have someone, you know, walking around like a zombie doing every, everything you ask, you know. They, you might see that on stage hypnosis, but basically what that is is people's natural exhibitionist tendencies. You know, in stage hypnosis, they usually bring up a huge group of people, and then they take the people out that, are, that aren't exhibitionists to begin with, basically. So to answer your question, it's, it's, it's dangerous, but it's not dangerous to the point of needing to be illegal or something like that. Uh, yes. By the way, if you guys want some books, just come up here. Yes. Could you, could you come up to the mic? All right, all right, what? Yeah, let's, let's, let's actually, let me, let me, um, let me, uh, no, what I, what I meant was, yeah, well, what I meant was for the people who answered the question, sorry about that, you guys. Yeah, I know, I totally, yeah, I screwed up in my communication, I was really ambiguous, sorry, you guys. I just, I, you know, I gave a command and everyone just followed it, you know? Jeez. All right. Are you viewing this as a temporary or as a permanent solution, or will it recall the past event? <laughs> Are you viewing this as a temporary or a permanent solution, or if you, after you go through hypnosis and you gain this new attitude, if you recall a past event, will it trigger it back to what you used to be? It, it can trigger it. It's, it's really about, um, you can do it in, in one session, and it can come back. However, the exercises are so easy that you can just do them again. Okay, actually, let me, let me do this. Let me just say we're going to, yeah, we're going to hold, hold questions until afterwards. Pe people are just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, I, I have lots of information. Actually, afterwards and also I'll be, I'll be around. I'm not going anywhere. So after the talk, please, you know, ask me questions. All right. And the last one. Uh, let's see. People are always making the best. Oh, people are always making the best choices available to them. Um, that idea is just basically people are always making the best choices that they believe they have. If if you give someone better choices, they'll make better choices. And the last one, um, if what you're doing isn't working, do something else. Do anything else. A lot of times, if something isn't working, people just do more of what isn't working. The idea is you just do something else, anything else. You know, if if you're inside and you feel depressed, go outside. It's really that simple. And, and, and maybe it's not the solution, but it's a step. You gotta just do something else. Okay, now let's get to the good stuff. We're you know done with the the theory. Let's get to the application. All right. So building physical rapport. Um, and the the way that you ba basically when I say rapport. Um, what I mean is, is that you're, you're in, I mean, the, the best way to describe it is rapport, but you're, you're basically on the same level as someone. Um, and the secret to liking is that people like people who are like them. Um, a lot of people say opposites, tra opposites attract. That's not necessarily true. People like people who are like them. So the way to build physical rapport is mirroring and matching. Now, just to, just as like sort of a disclaimer, and I'll go over it a little bit uh, a little bit later. Also, when I say mirroring and matching, I don't mean mimicking. There's a difference. Um, you know, if somebody has an accent, don't mimic their accent. You know. You know, or I mean, unless unless that's something you do, people do that. <laughs> but be congruent if you're going to do it. Um, okay. So body, body, body position, posture, m movement, rhythm. Body position is really simple. You know, people stand different ways. Some people, let's see if I can get this. So some people stand with their arms crossed. Some people stand with one, one foot out. You know, just, 
you, you just kind of match the way they're standing. Again, don't mimic the way they're standing. You know, if somebody is standing with their, with their foot out, you know, you can stand with your foot a little bit out. A little body position is actually a little easier to, to get a little bit more dangerous and really start mimicking people because um, a lot of times, you know, you'll, a lot of times when you see people who really know, them, know each other and are talking to each other, you know, they'll be facing each other, their legs will be crossed in the same way, um, their head will be turned in the same way, their arms will be in the same way. So you can, you can go pretty far with this. Um, posture. Same thing, you know, if people stand slunched over, you know, upright, same deal. Movement. This is something where you want to be careful with, with mimicking. Um, if somebody does something like, you know, scratches the back of their, their neck, you can go ahead and, you know, scratch your shoulder. You know, or if somebody, you can match leg movements with arm movements. If somebody moves their leg, you can move their arm and, and you can move your arm and vice versa. It, it's basically just, just having a, a reciprocal movement to go along. Um, body rhythm is good. A lot of people move really, a lot of people will move really quickly, they'll move really, they'll move slowly, they'll move in, in jolts, they'll move in like smooth curves. You just want to, you want to just sort of match, you know, the way they're moving. Now breathing is, is more important than you'd think. Um, there is a, uh, well, <laughs> breathing is more important than you'd think. I can tell there's some NLP people in here that are, that are recognizing the commands I'm giving people, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> don't forget to breathe. Uh, um, <laughs> whatever you do, I'm not suggesting that you forget to breathe, but when you do. Um, okay, so breathing, breathing there's this, um, you know, while getting into like the new age stuff, the idea is, you know, the your breath really is the foundation for all the rest of the things you do with your body. Um, if you want to relax, the best way is to breathe deeply for, you know, 20 minutes. You know, so if, if you begin to match someone's breathing, you can gain rapport very quickly. And you, you'll find yourself um, automatically gaining rapport a lot of the time <clears throat> just by matching breathing. Um, and Milton Erickson does this with hypnosis by matching someone's breathing. But he also paces, and we'll get into that later. Voice. Voice is also a big thing. Um, voice tone. So if somebody, some people, some people have really, really high voices, really, really annoying voices, you know, you can, you can match that if you're trying to get any poor. Although it's a really annoying high pitch, I suggest that anyone with a high-pitched voice, get over yourself and lower your voice. Because people will take you much more seriously if you, if you have... Uh, a lower voice tone. Um, speed. Some people talk really fast. Some people talk really slowly. Be sure to match that because if, if someone is talking really slowly at you and in a really low tone and you talk at them like this, and you, you know, they're not going to listen to you. Well, they might listen to you, but you're not going to have rapport. So don't mimic. Again, don't mimic. Don't ma Don't try to mimic their their accents. You know, unless you find yourself naturally. Some people find themselves naturally doing that, matching accents. Sometimes I find myself doing it. It's just something that we do. It's it's part of human nature. But if you're going to do it consciously, be congruent about it. You know, you know. Get, if you're in the foreign country, matching matching uh, matching um, accents, do it the whole time you're there, or you're going to get caught. All right. Um, now, building physical rapport is something you've, you've probably all heard about um, at least a little bit. Matching verbal rapport is something that you'll hear about more on the tapes and more in the books. And this is something that's also very important, something that most people don't think about. Basically, um, like, okay, so you've heard of the representational systems. Probably, you probably all heard of representational systems, you know, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Um, and just as a side note, some people will tell you, they'll make you fill out that form, you know, and they'll say, you are a kinesthetic. That is bullshit. There's, there's, no, one, there's no one here that is a kinesthetic. People use different representational systems in different contexts. And some people lead with different representational systems. But does not mean that everything you do is kinesthetic. 
Um, one, one NLP trainer said, if you go to an NLP seminar and they tell you you're a visual, ask for your money back because they do not know what they're talking about. So people usually, there's the, uh, the representational systems, and uh, people usually prefer a lead with one or two. So with that in mind, how do we use that to match someone verbally? What people might not realize is that we, we will give off our representational systems by the way that we talk. And the way to determine this is through something called predicates. Um, and basically what predicates are is everything after it including the verb of a sentence. So, um, so, if, I, if, so if I say, um, let's see, so if I say, uh, I, I went to the park yesterday. The predicate is went to the park yesterday, everything after the verb. Now, sometimes predicates can give away the representational systems. And I'll show you how. Here's an example. Somebody says, I can see what you're saying clearly. Now, somebody who says, I can see what you're saying clearly, as opposed to, I can hear you loudly, or I can get a grasp on what you're saying, that person is using a visual representational system. Now, in NLP, it's taught that communicating with someone using the same representational system they're using can help to gain rapport. So if somebody says to you, I can see what you're saying clearly, say, I, um, I, I see, I, we're seeing eye to eye, you know, or something like that. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to leave you in the dark. I'll give you some examples. Some uh, visual phrases, I see what you mean, we see eye to eye, the future looks bright. Um, some auditory phrases, loud and clear, unheard of, word for word. Kinesthetic phrases, I can grasp that idea. Um, I got the hang of it, um, I will get in touch with you. And you won't see, you won't see um, olfactory or uh, gustatory phrases all that much, but there are people out there who experience their, word through, their world through food. Um, I've met some of them, so <laughs> be aware that people, will, people will, uh, will really appreciate you using these sort of phrases. And these are mixed together because taste and smell are mixed together. So that's basically building rapport. So um, let's see, I have 30, okay, so I'm gonna skip submodalities and I'm gonna go, but I'm gonna do this motiv uh, motivational strategies. So, so once you've gained rapport, it's a lot easier to influence someone. Just gaining rapport can, I mean, when somebody says, you know, I, you know, I just trust this person. I don't know why, but I really do just trust them. Then, you know, what they're saying is you're in rapport with them, basically. So once you have that, once you have that down, then you can go into influencing things. You can do influ influencing um, stuff before rapport, but it's not going to work as well, or it might not even work at all sometimes. So what are meta programs? Meta programs are perceptional filters. Like when I talked about before, the map is not the territory. Uh, meta programs are basically that map. And there are a lot of them in NLP. The one I'm gonna go over is motivation strategies. And there are basically two motivation strategies that people use. One is toward, where people are motivated towards their goals and go for what they want. The other one is away from, motivated to avoid what you don't want. Now, it's probably better, <coughs> excuse me, it's probably better to have a toward uh, motivation strategy. However, most people have an away from motivation strategy. So to give you an idea of how this works, how this works in, in real life, um, people who are toward motivated will get out of bed and think about will get out of bed because they're thinking about um, what they're going to do today and how much you know, money they're going to make or you know, how many new people they're going to meet or you know, how close they are to that goal. You know, it's, it, it's, it's really positive. And away from people are get out of bed because they don't want to be late. You know, they, they don't want, you know, they're, they're seeing images of their boss yelling at them, you know, and they're like, oh, my boss is going to yell at me. I don't want that to happen, so I'm going to have to get out of bed. 
Um, and that's basically how it works. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sh uh, I'm not gonna do a submodality uh, demonstration, but I'll basically talk about what submodalities are and how to use them in using with motivation strategies. If you get some of the books or you know go online and do some more research, you can get a lot more into this. Um, actually, let me just explain exactly what submodalities are. So modalities are you know visual, auditory, kinesthetic, right? So submodalities are basically, so in visual, it's um, how big or bright a picture is in your mind or, or how close it is to you when you think about it in your mind. So this comes with the idea that the way we think and perceive about something is directly linked to the way we feel about it. So if we, if when, when we think about um, a situation in our minds, it's big and bright in front of us, then that means something to us. Um, you know, you have to look at it as meaning different things to different people, but for the majority of people, when an image is bigger and brighter in the mind, it's a lot more positive, it's a lot more, um, you're a lot more motivated to do whatever it is. So for visual representational system, the bigger and brighter an image is in your mind, the more real, close, or attractive it feels. So, how do you use this to influence someone? Pretty simply, use submodality and phrases to make the picture they want in their head as big and bright as possible. And you can bind them with motivation strategies. Um, so, have a couple examples. They're a little bit, they're a little bit extreme and kind of cheesy actually, um, but it gets the point across. So, for away from, let's read it here. Um, I know you want to avoid a potentially big situation by pissing off the boss. So do I. Let's just get this done before it gets any bigger. I don't know if you can see things that are uh, underlined here. It says, okay, so here, you want to avoid a potentially uh, big situation. So that's a submodality word. Thinking about the images that they're going to create in their head. You know, people, w when people, th you can't think about something without having an image associated with it or a sound associated with it or something something uh, subjective associated with it. So this taps into that. So you want to avoid a potentially big situation um, before it gets any bigger. So that's for away from. For toward, I know you want to make the boss happy, and if you do this, um, I know he'll have a big, bright smile on his face. And the future you want in the company will be closer than ever. So have your underline, uh, big, bright, and that's a uh, submodality word, and then closer than never. So brighter, closer, uh, more attractive. Great. All right. So now the fun stuff, the Milton model. Now, the Milton model is something that was developed by Milton X. Eric well, something that was developed from the study with Milton H. Erickson. And it's used to pace and lead a person's reality, to distract and utilize the conscious mind, to access unconscious resources, and it's used for hypnotic induction, therapy, and influence. I'm not gonna go over um, all the details with it. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll um, refer you to a book that goes over it in extreme detail, um, but I'm gonna give you a few little, a little tools for it. But first, let me talk about what pacing and leading means. Now, I've already taught you basically what pacing is. Basically, pacing um, is rapport. So once you've gained rapport with someone, you're, you're starting where they're starting. P pacing like how fast you're, you're yeah. Not, not, not pacing, um, yeah, not, not pacing by walking back and forth. No, yeah, P pacing in the, in the terms of you are, you know, you're, you're, you're pacing them like you were walking next to them, right? And you're walking at the same speed as they are. And you can actually try this with someone, um, pay a really good pacing and leading ex uh, experiment. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that um, after I talk about leading. But pacing is basically you start where the other person is. So that's rapport. Um, also, describing an ongoing experience can also do it. I'm, kinda, I'm a little bit short on time. So I'm going to go a little bit quicker through this. 
Okay, so leading, once, you, once you've uh, started where they're starting, you can then begin to make suggestions very slowly. Usually it's you, you pace, usually it, you, uh, you pace, and then you lead, and then you, you pace again, and then you lead some more kind of thing. Well, I think it's actually pace, 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 lead, pace, pace, lead, pace, lead, 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 lead kind of thing. Um, indirect deep structure of sentence, sorry. There we go, okay, so techniques for the Milton model. So basically, like I said before, the Milton model is the reverse of the meta model. So its whole purpose is to make communication vague, but in a way that is leading the mind that you want to influence in a certain way. So, one of the, one of the uh, major techniques is ambiguity. Um, and an example of ambiguity would be certain things might come to mind. Um, you might say, when you, when you think about being relaxed, certain things might come to mind. What does that mean? That means something personal to the person that you're talking to, and that means that it's gonna be them making the images, and it's not, they're not gonna, you know, you're not telling them, you know, think about the last time you were playing golf. You know, maybe you don't play golf. You're telling them certain things might come to mind, and it's a lot more effective. Another one, people can. People can begin to feel more comfortable when listening to a good speaker. So who are these people, right? Are you talking, are you talking about, um, are you talking about the, the, the audience? Are you talking about a speaker? Are you talking about people in a foreign country? You're just saying people. But in, but in order to really understand that sentence, you know, people will make certain assumptions about it. And so some people will assume that it's them. And that's the, that's the goal of that one. Um, so another one, another one is presuppositions, which are assumptions that have to be made in order to, to make sense of a sentence. These are really powerful because y your, your mind has to process things that are given to it. it you, you, you can't talk to someone and have them not process which, what the, you've told them. So your brain has to make sense of these things somehow. So. One of, the, one of the ways of doing this is by saying something like, will you be more relaxed if you stand up or sit down? Seems like a pretty innocuous sentence, but what's the, what's the presupposition here? That you'll be relaxed no matter what, right? And this, this is, Milton uses this, and you can use this um, in, your own, in your own way. I'm not, I'm not here to tell you how to use this stuff. I'm just showing, showing you how it's done. All right. So after you've told me uh, what I need to know, you can go back to what you were doing. So this, of course, has a presupposition that you're going to tell me what I need to know. So those are two examples of presuppositions. Another one is embedded commands. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, myths about embedded commands. Some people, some people think that embedded commands are like, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, you're just talking like this and, and you're just saying something, give me money, and you're just, you know, you just keep talking, you know, right? That's not an embedded command, although that's some, that, uh, some, uh, that's subliminal and um, there's been some research in that, that it actually, it actually works. But um, embedded commands are ways of structuring sentences with commands in them in a way that the sentence itself seems very innocuous. So for example, I don't know if you can listen carefully to what I have to say. Now, this is just, uh, it, it's, it doesn't mean anything. I don't know, it's, I, I'm saying something about myself. I don't know if, right? But the command here is listen carefully to what I have to say. Now, one, one thing about commands that I should point out is the way to do it most effectively is to actually change the tone of your voice. Um, we actually have different voice tones associated with different types of sentences. So if I say something and my voice goes up, 
it's sort of a question, right? If I say something and my voice doesn't do anything, I'm just dictating it. But if I say something and my voice goes down, it's a command. So what you want to do is you want to say it like, I don't know if you can listen carefully to what I have to say. It's hard to really pick up, but it's, you, you just gotta, you just gotta think about, you have to separate it in your mind. You think about, I don't know if you can listen carefully to what I have to say. And unless somebody knows NLP, they're not gonna pick up on it. And if somebody does know NLP, they'll realize that you always have a choice to follow a command or not. You're, you know, it's not like if I say this command, it's gonna happen. You know, it's, it's just, you always have a choice, but some people want, some people are more open to things in different contexts. When I talk to people, when I talk, people are able to listen carefully to what I have to say. This combines two different things. This combines uh, ambiguity and embedded commands. Who are the people? Um, and then you can see the command there. And the last one is a combination of a whole different things. It goes, you don't have to listen carefully to what I have to say, but as you do, you'll begin to realize how you can use NLP in your own life. And I hope you take that one to heart. <laughs> All right, so sources and resources. It's really hard to find uh, good resources on NLP because there's a lot of people who think NLP is mind control or there's a lot of people who are making a whole shitload of money off NLP. I mean, 2,000 bucks for a week seminar. Oh, 2,000 bucks for a weekend seminar, you know? So I have some books that I'll show you. Um, one of them is Introducing NLP. This one, it's a really great resource for NLP. It, it goes through just, you know, the Milton model, modeling, meta model. It goes through everything in one book. And you can pick this up, Amazon, you know, wherever. The other one, it's one I was talking about before, NLP, the New Technology of Achievement. Uh, this book is really, is really good because it's interactive. It actually, it teaches you NLP and all the different uh, techniques but it also takes you through all of the exercises. And you know, the idea in therapy and NLP is you go first. You know, if you wanna use NLP, use it on yourself first or have someone else use it on you first. But this is a really good book, even if you're not all that interested in NLP, but you're interested in, in uh, you know, self-help and things like that. This is a great book. And if you're really, really interested in, or even just sort of interested, in uh, the, uh, in Milton Erickson, or Indirect Hypnosis, I would definitely suggest this book. This is The Patterns of the Hypnotic Techniques of Milton H. Erickson, Volume 1. There's two volumes. Uh, get Volume 1. If you really like Volume 1, get Volume 2, because it's a, it's a lot more complicated. But this uh, has a, f a couple sections. One section uh, goes over uh, different articles written by Milton Erickson. Another section analyzes those articles by Richard Bandler and John Grinder, and then another section just gives you all the techniques. So, that is my talk, and I have like three minutes for questions. <laughs> and if if you have like, I can take like one or two questions. I can take like one or two questions, right? Yeah. Come up to the mic, yeah. I was just wondering, uh, would you use this technique like over a period of time to talk your boss into giving you a raise or a promotion or something along those lines? You, you could if you really wanted to. <laughs> I would not suggest that you go out and do that now, but if you were to do it, he's not here. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, if you want, these are the well, the. well, those no. These are just the books. These are just my display books here. If you want to, if you want a free book, I can give you writing writing great code. Oh, I write great code. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to write great code? I have stuff to give. All right. 